So it's my, it's my great pleasure to welcome um, Michelle Mungi um, to give the first actually external speaker seminar um, in, in our new cancer neuroscience, neuroscience instructed cancer therapy seminar series. And um, I think just, just as a very small housekeeping remark before I forget to say that. So um, during Michelle's, um, uh, Michelle's talk, please write your questions into the chat. And then Varun Ben Katramani, who's with us here, um, will then later pick up after Michelle's talk and then moderate the Q&A um, by your, by your, um, uh, from your comments and your questions. Um, so yeah, I think introducing Michelle is a, is a, is a great pleasure. It is, it's probably, I don't know, it's difficult and easy at the same time. So Michelle um, has spearheaded the field of cancer neuroscience clearly. Um, I mean, investigating, looking at it at various angles, starting with, um, with uh, toxic deleterious effects of cancer therapies on the nervous system, yeah, radiotherapy and, and, uh, and um, brain stem and progenitor cells and how that can be um, and potentially um, 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 alleviated or, or um, 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 improved. Um, so that, that um, this is, of course, one important aspect of the field, then moving um, as, a, as a, a cancer um, as, as a cancer researcher and, and a pediatric neuro-oncologist and a neuroscientist to um, and, and then in, with a lab in Stanford and Michelle is a, is a professor of neurology um, in Stanford um, and, um, and as I said, neuroscientist at the same time, pediatric neuro-oncologist and um, seeing a lot of patients um, and conducting clinical trials and doing fantastic, um, 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 yeah, very basic and very important groundbreaking, I would say, research in her lab in Stanford. Um, um, publishing that research, of course, in, in all top journals you can think of, Nature Cell Science, multiple times. Um, it's easy if you can read PubMed, it's easy to find her there. So, um, and then, then moving from, from, from these, uh, these kind of early interests to kind of questions of more paracrine interactions of brain activity with cancer, uh, growth in the brain um, in, in pediatric and uh, and also adult uh, brain cancer entities, then moving uh, further to even synaptic interactions between neurons and cancer cells in the brain. And last but not least, um, just lately this year, um, co senior authoring a paper in which she describes um, um, yeah, how neuro 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 neuronal activity can actually drive cancer initiation in a certain genetic predisposition syndrome. So I think we learned about all that um, um, soon. And so uh, this is why I'm so glad and so happy that Michelle said yes when, when uh, we asked her to give this kind of first introductory um, uh, talk um, in, into the field, um, give an external view. Um, Michelle is also driving the field, pushing the field forward. She organized the, uh, the first, I would say, kind of larger, important meeting a multidisciplinary meeting um, at Benbury, uh, that's a Cold Spring Harbor site where uh, many people in, involved in the field uh, met in late 2019. I think it was one of the last meetings before the, the, the pestilence broke out. And it was a fantastic meeting, a fantastic white paper and cell came out of it. And um, so, yeah, I think now I stop talking. Uh, the stage is all yours, Michelle, and we're really looking forward to your talk. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this introduction as well. Um, and so, so yes, I want to talk about this emerging field of cancer neuroscience and the lessons that we learn from nervous system development for cancer. It's, it's very clear that oncology recapitulates ontogeny, that development teaches us about cancers. And in the nervous system, one of the you know, most powerful factors regulating brain development and plasticity is activity of the nervous system itself. And it turns out that nervous system activity regulates not just neurodevelopment, actually, but development broadly across different organ systems, across different tissue types. We know from the work of Sarah Knox and others that um, innervation of nascent developing organs is actually required for proper organogenesis. And taking an example from glandular tissues, um, the salivary gland, for example, has been shown not to develop if parasympathetic innervation 
is, um, is interrupted. And there's this very clear role for the nervous system in regulating the normal neural stem and tissue precursor niche for the developing organ to encourage appropriate ingrowth in this bi-directional communication during development, um, guiding appropriate innervation and neural regulation of um, organogenesis and then ongoing tissue homeostasis and regeneration. And given everything that we know about cancer, um, you know, hijacking mechanisms of normal development and plasticity, regeneration, homeostasis, it's not surprising that many um, different cancers hijack these really powerful um, neural signals to promote their growth. And so glandular cancers have been shown by Paul Frenette's and others, group, others groups um, to very, uh, very closely resemble this process of normal organogenesis, whereby the tumor incurs encourages axon ingrowth um, through secretion of neurotrophic factors, and then the, the innervating nerves in the, in the cancer microenvironment drive malignancy through, um, at least through paracrine interactions, often that are neurotransmitter mediated. And these kinds of neural um, influences on cancer have now been described across a range of different malignancies, including prostate, pancreas, stomach, colon, skin, breast, and many other forms of cancer. And so I'm gonna focus um, my talk as I focus my, my, my laboratory and my clinical practice on the example of glial malignancies um, and, and understanding what we can about glial malignancies by better understanding um, what normally regulates the behavior of healthy glial cells. And so I wanna tell you a story now, um, kind of in two parts about the way that the nervous system regulates glial plasticity in the oligodendroglial lineage, the, um, the cell lineage that forms the insulating myelin sheath that's so important for fine tuning neural circuit dynamics and function, and how these really powerful neuron glial interactions that are at play in the healthy brain and regulate both brain development and ongoing plasticity and adaptation are subverted in the context of glial malignancies to drive glial cancer growth. <clears throat> We know that myelination, this process of an oligodendrocyte in sheathing axonal membranes to decrease transverse capacitance and increase the speed of neural impulse conduction together with providing metabolic support for the axon is a fascinatingly protracted developmental process in the human nervous system. It begins perinatally and, and there's a massive wave of myelination in the first couple of years of life. But then myelination proceeds over about three decades of human neural development. Um, so there's probably many people listening to this talk right now who are not yet done with developmental myelination. Um, and this, this protracted, you know, 30 year or so process follows really predictable chronological and topographical patterns such that in general, neural circuits that, that underlie more basic function like sensation and movement myelinate prior to those that underlie more complex functions like higher cognitive function. And so for example, there's a discrete wave of myelination in the brainstem in mid-childhood, in, particularly in the corticospinal tract um, that underlies movement. And then in adolescence and young adulthood, there's a discrete wave of neocortical and intracortical association fiber myelination, important for higher associative cognitive function for impulse control, et cetera. <clears throat> And so this process of myelination, this process of axonal ensheathment by oligodendrocytes that are generated by oligodendrocyte precursor cells that remain in the postnatal and adult brain um, that, that form a regular pattern throughout the brain and account for about eight to 10% of all of the cells in the brain, continually ongoing um, proliferation and new oligodendrocyte generation. This process doesn't end at the end of developmental myelination, but actually in particular parts of the nervous system like the neocortex and these neocortical association fibers, there's ongoing myelination throughout the lifespan until very old age with an accumulation of new oligodendrocytes and an accumulation of myelin. And this is intrinsically interesting, but it's also really important when we consider that glial malignancies of childhood may arise in the context of dysregulation 
of myelination. And, and I say that because these gliomas happen in a very predictable spatiotemporal pattern that maps really well onto the places in which there's active myelination. And that observation is concordant from findings in, in, from my lab and from others that many forms of glioma arise um, from precursor cells perhaps in the oligodendroglial lineage, either early oligodendrocyte precursor cells or the neural stem cells that form those cells. And so at a time when there is active myelination in the brain stem in mid-childhood, this is when one of the, the most lethal and, and, and terrible cancers occurs, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, now called H3K27, a mutant diffuse midline glioma of the pons. And similarly, at a time when there's a, this discrete wave of neocortical and hemispheric myelination, this is when adolescent glioblastomas um, or high-grade gliomas of the hemispheres tend to occur. And so we made learn really important clues to gliomagenesis by better understanding what normally regulates this process of gliogenesis. And so that raises a really fundamental question of what factors do control the proliferation and functional differentiation of precursor cells in the oligodendric glial lineage. And one hypothesis that um, has had been in the field and the glial field for a number of years, but that until recently remained fairly controversial, is the idea that neurons themselves may be regulating the extent to which their axons are myelinated, and that this could be happening in an experience and activity dependent manner. This was a controversial concept because they're also very clearly activity independent modes of myelination. We know that oligodendrocytes will myelinate any fiber of appropriate diameter. And so this, this introduced some, some debate, some controversy. When I began my own, my own laboratory about 10 years ago, already kind of focused on glial malignancies and wanting to understand the relationship between neurons and gliomas, um, taking a step back to the normal disease, this is one of the very first questions that we asked. Does neuronal activity regulate myelination? Could myelin be plastic and adaptable in adolescence or ongoing in adulthood? And so I wanna focus the next few minutes on this idea of myelin plasticity, this form of neuroplasticity um, based in, in glial cells. And to introduce you to the people who led this work, this is Erin Gibson, um, who is who was a postdoctoral fellow in my lab. She's now leading her own research group at Stanford University. If anybody is looking for um, a postdoctoral fellowship or a, a, just a wonderful colleague, I strongly recommend Erin. And this is Anna Garrity, who's currently an instructor in my laboratory. And what Anna and Erin and many others in the lab have done is to leverage tools and systems neuroscience to understand um, these um, interactions between neurons, between uh, neurons and uh, glial cells. And so this technique of optogenetics um, has been very, very useful to us. While it's familiar to many people in the audience, I'll just describe it. This allows, this technique allows for control of action potentials in targeted populations of neurons through expression of these microbial light sensitive opsins. This is channel word opsin 2, which is a blue light sensitive cation channel. And if we express this um, channel word opsin 2 isolated from algae in um, cortical projection neurons, for example, we can then control their firing with blue light. And if we do that in the motor planning area of the mouse, here's a mouse with channel word opsin 2 expressed in the cortical projection neurons. When we deliver pulses of blue light, the mouse begins to execute complex motor behavior. And then and we can ask really straightforward questions. Now, knowing that we've recruited this circuit in a physiomimetic way about how other cell types within the stimulated circuit responds to these changes in neuronal activity. And what we discovered was that um, cortical projection neuronal activity results in rapid and robust proliferation of oligodendrocyte precursor cells and just earlier pre-OPCs, specifically within the stimulated circuit. Those, if we fate map those cells over time by administering the thymidine analog EBU at the time of neuronal activity, we find that those cells generate new oligodendrocytes. 
and that the myelinated ultrastructure within the stimulated circuit changes over time and changes in a way that we would predict might alter circuit dynamics and therefore influence function. And what we found was that indeed there was an improvement in mouse motor functional behavior that depended upon the generation of new oligodendrocytes. So this concept of myelin plasticity, the addition of, um, you know, and addition of new oligodendrocytes and changes to myelin structure can occur in, in a few different um, ways. The new oligodendrocytes can myelinate previously unmyelinated, unmyelinated axons or can myelinate unmyelinated regions of intermittently myelinated axons. And then in a third um, mechanism, existing oligodendrocytes or the new oligodendrocytes can remodel existing myelin sheaths. And these relatively subtle changes in, myelinate, in myelination can confer really important changes to circuit dynamics that tune neural circuit function. <clears throat> The mechanisms that mediate these interactions between neurons and oligodendroglial lineage uh, precursor cells are an area of, this is an area of active research, but we know that one required mechanism, at least in cortical projection neurons, is activity regulated secretion of the neurotrophin brain derived neurotrophic factor, or BDNF, signaling to oligodendrocyte precursor cells through the receptor TREK-B, also called NTREK2. And while this is part, we think, of a much more complex mechanism, because it is a required component of neuron glial interactions regulating myelin plasticity, that gives us a molecular handle to begin to ask questions about how activity-regulated myelination may contribute to neurological and cognitive function. I want to point out that while BDNF to TREK-B signaling is one um, important component, we believe that that interaction is happening at these really intriguing and well-described but poorly understood neuron to OPC synapses. There are bona fide electrophysiologically functional synapses, first described by Dwight Burgles and then characterized by many other groups that form between neurons and oligodendrocyte precursor cells. These are present on the vast majority of oligodendrocyte precursor cells. They're both uh, glutamatergic as well as GABAergic, um, but their role in myelin biology is still really very much um, under investigation. What we do know by blocking specifically activity-dependent myelination is that this process plays really important roles in a range of neurological functions, including attention, memory, and certain forms of learning. But what happens when the OPC or OPC-like cells are malignant rather than healthy? Could this really powerful interaction between neurons and glial precursor cells be subverted in the context of glial malignancies? And so I wanna focus uh, the majority of the rest of the talk on this idea of malignant myelin plasticity of activity dependent glioma growth. And to introduce you to the people who have been um, doing this work in my laboratory, this was work that was initially undertaken by and, and led by a, a then brilliant cancer biology um, a PhD student, Hamsa Venkatesh. She went on to do a postdoctoral fellowship in my lab and then um, just a few months ago left Stanford um, to make a new home in Boston and start her own laboratory at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Harvard Medical School. So again, if there's anybody interested in cancer neuroscience, um, who is looking for a postdoctoral fellowship, I cannot recommend Humps's lab uh, more strongly. <laughs> She's absolutely brilliant. Um, this is Ewan Pan, who has just is a postdoctoral fellow in the lab who's just accepted a faculty position at MD Anderson, so she'll be moving soon to Texas, and I again encourage people to look at her lab. Um, she's just a, a wonderful, wonderful scientist. And this is Katie Taylor, who has been, um, uh, is a current postdoctoral fellow, um, leading some of the more recent work in the laboratory. And these are the cancers that, um, as a pediatric neuro-oncologist, I spend the most time thinking about these gliomas of childhood, which, as I mentioned previously, arise in this really predictable spatiotemporal pattern. So just to introduce you to some of the cancers that um, we'll be talking about, this is um, an optic pathway glioma arising in the optic nerve of a young child, a four-year-old, uh, with the neurofibromatosis type 1 cancer predisposition syndrome. This is a six-year-old child with one of the worst um, brain cancers, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. 
a molecularly related um, tumor occurring in the thalamus, another H3K27M mutant uh, diffuse midline glioma occurring um, in the thalamus of a 10-year-old. And here are, is a histone wild type hemispheric um, high grade glioma occurring in an adolescent. And the idea that neuronal activity may be promoting the growth of these glial malignancies is something that, you know, I think has been suggested for some time by neurohistopathological observations made, you know, almost 100 years ago, first by um, Charles Shear in the 1930s. These, um, uh, the propensity of malignant glioma cells to cluster in very tight microanatomical association with mature neurons in the tumor microenvironment, this so-called perineuronal satellitosis or secondary structure of shear, um, really suggests that there are critically important interactions ongoing between the malignant cells and neurons. Um, I also want to point out that this particular H&E image comes from an early postmortem autopsy specimen from a five-year-old patient of mine went back when I was a, a neuro-oncology fellow who died from diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma. And it was this child's brain donation that allowed us to make the first cell culture and mouse model, xenograph mouse model of DIPG. And it's really through similar such donations of tissue by patients and their families that we're able to do the work that we do. And so I just want to acknowledge that critically important contribution. And so to ask whether neuronal activity might similarly promote the proliferation and progression of glial malignancies as it does their normal counterparts, we use that same optogenetic um, uh, experimental paradigm, stimulating uh, action potentials and cortical projection neurons through light delivered at the brain surface, but this time in the context of a diffusely infiltrating high-grade um, cortical glioblastoma isolated from an adolescent patient of mine. And what we found was that uh, just like their normal counterparts, the malignant glioma cells increase their, their rate of proliferation, and this increases the overall tumor burden specifically within the stimulated circuit. And so it became clear that indeed neuronal activity can drive brain cancer growth. Looking at a different tumor type and a different experimental model system, <clears throat> in collaboration with David Gutman's lab, we used these really experimentally tractable um, mice, mouse, genetically engineered mouse models that the Gutman lab has developed, um, modeling neurofibromatosis type one associated optic pathway gliomas. And in um, patients with optic pathway glioma and in these mice, the tumors emerge in the juvenile period and in the mice very predictably around nine weeks of age. We found that if we optogenetically stimulated the optic nerve just prior to the onset of these tumors, um, that this resulted in much larger tumors forming in optogenetically stimulated mice compared to identically manipulated but not stimulated litter mate controls. Now this Optic pathway glioma mouse model allows us to ask another set of questions because it arises in a predictable way in a very, very tractable circuit that we can modulate just with changing environmental experience. And so, you know, if we want to change the circuit activity within the optic pathway, we can do so very simply by altering visual experience and, and really quite simply putting the mice in darkness. And so if we take these mice that are prone to develop, more, more than 95% of the mice develop optic pathway gliomas around nine weeks of age, if we take those mice and put them in the dark to decrease optic nerve activity around the time of tumor formation or just afterwards, we find that far fewer and much smaller tumors form compared to litter mate controls raised with normal visual experience. And if we place these mice in darkness to decrease optic nerve activity prior to the onset of these tumors, we find that no tumors form, despite the genetic predisposition to optic gliomas in this mouse model, really underscoring the power of the interactions between neurons and glioma cells, not just for brain tumor progression, but also for initiation. So what are the factors that are, you know, what are the mechanisms that are mediating these powerful interactions? 
When we first hypothesized that there may be activity dependent paracrine signaling um, uh, interactions that were, you know, are driving this, uh, this pathophysiology. And so we tested that idea um, simply by taking explants of either mouse cortex or mouse retina and optic nerve, and then collecting the secreted factors in the condition medium when the neurons in those explants exhibit varying levels of neuronal activity, either spontaneous neuronal activity, increased um, neuronal activity through optogenetic stimulation, or when uh, action potentials were silenced using the voltage-gated sodium channel blocker to trototoxin. And what we found is that when we took the secreted factors contained in this conditioned medium and placed them um, onto glioma cells in culture, that there was an activity dose-dependent increase in glioma cell proliferation abrogated um, when neurons were silenced. Now, we know that gliomas are a family of very molecularly and clinically distinct entities. Um, but we found that the response to activity regulated secreted factors um, in, induced proliferation across a wide range of different forms of glioma, from um, histone wild type pediatric cortical high grade gliomas to diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, um, an IDH wild type adult glioblastoma, IDH mutant anaplastic oligodendroglioma, and mouse models of um, optic pathway glioma. So what's in the condition medium? Well, through biochemical and proteomic analyses, we found that there were two key factors. Uh, not unexpectedly, just as it plays an important role in normal neuron glial interactions, we found that brain-derived neurotrophic factor um, could function as a, a real, you know, weak to moderate um, glioma mitogen. But really unexpectedly, we found this shed form of a synaptic adhesion molecule called neuroligin-3. Now, neuroligin-3 is a really well-known molecule. It plays important roles in regulating synaptic strength and in certain mutant forms contributes um, to autism spectrum disorders. But it was not known to be a mitogen in any context. And in fact, it wasn't even known to be secreted. But we find that neuroligin-3 is cleaved at the membrane um, in a strictly activity-dependent way through the enzymatic activity of the metalloprotease atom 10, resulting in shedding of this large N-terminal ectodomain into the tumor microenvironment. So the next uh, question that we asked was, what cell types are secreting neuroligin-3? Well, neuroligin-3 is expressed, you know, it's a postsynaptic adhesion molecule. Of course, it's, a, it's expressed across a range of different neuronal subtypes. But remember, oligodendrocyte precursor cells are also a postsynaptic cell type. And it turns out express the highest levels of neuroligin-3 in the healthy brain. And through genetic um, mouse modeling, in which we conditionally and inducibly deleted neuroligin-3 from different cell types, we found that not only neurons, but really importantly, oligodendrocyte precursor cells contribute to this secreted pool of neuroligin-3 in the tumor microenvironment, not only placing the OPC in an important way in, in the brain tumor microenvironment, but really asking some important basic questions about what role neuroligin-3 may be playing in healthy myelin physiology. So the next set of questions that we asked was, you know, how important is this particular molecule? It's one, it's one molecule. There are many different ways that glioma cells, um, you know, proliferate in a cell intrinsic way, many different microenvironmental factors regulating glioma progression. <clears throat> and so we, we tested the relative importance of neuroligin-3 to tumor progression by xenografting brain cancer cells into the environment of either the neuroligin-3 wild type or neuroligin-3 knockout brain. And what we found is really unexpected. Rather than even just slowing glioma growth, we found a complete stagnation. At six months after xenografting, these GFP positive glioma cells in the wild type brain, you know, have grown and, and, and spread throughout, you know, throughout the, the neocortex and, and corpus callosum. But in the absence of neuroligin-3 from the microenvironment, here are the cells we had previously xenografted. They persist, but they don't expand. And, and this lack of progression in the absence of microenvironmental um, neuroligin-3, we found across a range of different glial malignancies from um, patient-derived models of pediatric glioblastoma, diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, either in the cortex or in the brainstem, and adult IDH wild-type glioblastoma. But we did not find that this apparent dependency on neuroligin-3 extended to a patient-derived model of breast cancer brain metastases. <clears throat> 
Now, turning back to that um, experimental model of um, optic pathway glioma, we wondered whether neuroligin-3 may be playing an important role in the optic nerve and in this low-grade glioma um, subtype as well. And that was actually suggested because we realized that there was an increase in the level of, of cleavage and secretion happening in the NF1 optic nerve compared to the wild type optic nerve, which suggested that aberrantly increased neuroligin-3 shedding might actually be part of the tumor predisposition to develop these optic gliomas. And so we, we did a simple experiment in which we took David Gutman's uh, neurofibromatosis type 1 optic pathway glioma mouse model and crossed it to a neuroligin-3 knockout mouse model. And what we found was that in the absence of neuroligin-3, but with normal optic pathway activity and visual experience, that far fewer and much smaller tumors formed compared to neuroligin-3 wild type litter mate controls. So I've just told you that neuroligin-3 is this really interesting um, therapeutic target and that ADAM10 is the enzyme that mediates its cleavage and release into the tumor microenvironment. And so we wondered whether blocking ADAM10 might phenocopy the loss of neuroligin-3 in those genetic mouse models and slow tumor growth. And indeed, what we found is that using a brain penetrant um, small molecule ADAM10 inhibitor, that there was a stark decrease in tumor growth over time across a range of both high grade glioma models as well as in optic pathway glioma. So I'm pleased to report that this is um, a clinical strategy that I've recently brought to clinical trial for children with high-grade gliomas in the United States, and I'm and, and very much hoping that this will prove to be as helpful for kids with high-grade gliomas as it has been in, in the mouse models. But why is neuroligin-3 such a powerful molecule? Why is it, why is it so important to glioma progression? Well, just to review what we know, um, neuronal activity results in activity-dependent uh, release of ADAM10 into the synaptic cleft that cleaves this N-terminal ectodomain of neuroligin-3 from a postsynaptic cell, either a neuron or an oligodendrocyte precursor cell. The shed um, N-terminal ectodomain of neuroligin-3 then binds to a um, receptor, a binding partner on the glioma cell that we're working very hard to identify right now. Um, and then downstream of that recruits numerous oncogenic signaling pathways. We know through phosphoproteomic studies that there's an early and upstream recruitment of focal adhesion kinase and then downstream stimulation of SARC, RAS, and PI3 kinase mTOR pathways. So that helps to explain the sufficiency of neuroligin-3 functioning as a mitogen, but it really doesn't explain this unexpected dependency. So digging deeper and looking at the gene expression changes attributable to neuroligin-3 binding, we find that neuroligin-3 upregulates a number of different synapse-associated genes in the glioma cell. There's a feed-forward effect of neuroligin-3 on its own expression, together with upregulation of the, TREC -B, of the BDNF receptor TREC-B, or NTREC-2, as well as a number of glutamate receptor subunit, especially AMPA receptor subunit genes and other synapse associated structural proteins. And so collaborating with Mario Suva's group um, and Mariella Philbin's group who have this beautiful um, database of single cell transcriptomic data um, taken from primary biopsy samples of the major forms of high-grade glioma, we find that in these primary biopsy samples that indeed the malignant cells do express a number of synapse-associated genes, prominent AMPA receptor subunit expression, the neuroligins and other um, structural proteins. And so looking at that single cell transcriptomic data in a different way, if we take a, any given tumor, we find that there is enrichment for synapse associated genes in a subpopulation of tumor cells, um, in this case, um, in, in diffuse midline gliomas that most closely resemble oligodendric glial precursor cells, cell types that normally engage in synaptic communication. And so this raised for us the, what seemed like a completely crazy idea at the time, that like there are synapses between neurons and healthy OPCs, there might also be synapses between neurons and glioma cells. And when we look at um, electron microscopy, either from primary biopsy samples or from um, uh, you know, patient-derived xenografts, we do see these very clear synaptic structures. <laughs> 
around the time we had this observation, I actually traveled to Heidelberg and, and got the chance to sit down with Frank Winkler and realized that we had both of our groups had found the same thing. So that made me feel less crazy, which is wonderful. So much of what I'm about to tell you, you, you will hear again in uh, Dr. Winkler's talk next week, um, his you know brilliant student of Varun uh, Venkatramani and, and together with Thomas Kunar um, have discovered many of the same things that I'm about to show you, or all of the same things I'm about to show you. So it's not so crazy, which was reassuring to us. Um, testing the idea that these neuron to glioma synapses might be regulated by neuroligin-3, that that may be perhaps the more fundamental role of this factor in, the, in tumor pathophysiology. We find that far fewer of these structural synapses form in the absence of microenvironmental neuroligin-3. But are these neuron to glioma synapses functional, or are these um, simply a shadow of the cell type from which we think these tumors emerge? Well, to test this, we collaborated with Rob Malenka's lab and performed whole cell patch clamp electrophysiology, in which we could um, record from these GFP labeled glioma cells xenografted to an experimentally tractable um, circuit, the hippocampus. So if we record from these tumor cells xenografted to the hippocampus in an acute hippocampal slice preparation, we can stimulate the axonal afferents into this region, the CA1 region, where the tumor cells are xenografted. Um, and then after recording, um, you know, whatever happens when you stimulate the axons, we can um, dye fill the cells and go back and make sure that we were recording from a malignant cell rather than accidentally from a normal cell. And what we found when we did this um, set of experiments was that in a subpopulation of, of cells in every patient-derived tumor model we examined, there were very clear excitatory postsynaptic currents. These um, millisecond timescale currents depended upon action potentials that were blocked by tetrodotoxin, and they exhibited multiple electrophysiological characteristics of bona fide synapses, including paired pulse facilitation and single vesicle events called mini EPSCs. More specifically, we and also um, uh, Varun and, and Frank and, and Thomas discovered that uh, the receptors mediating these neuron to glioma synapses are calcium permeable amper receptors. So we next wondered whether um, these neuron to glioma synapses uh, may be recruiting mechanisms of adaptive plasticity to reinforce this communication, whether there might actually be synaptic plasticity of neuron to glioma synapses. We know in the healthy brain that there are, um, you know, there's plasticity of synaptic strength that's regulated um, in some cases uh, through NMDA receptor dependent mechanisms and in other cases through um, BDNF to track B signaling. Well, we found that the glioma cells really did not express NMDA receptors, but both in diffuse intrinsic pontine glioma, in pediatric hemispheric gliomas, and in adult um, hemispheric gliomas, there are prominent um, populations of cells that express the um, TREK-B receptor. And so we wondered whether BDNF, rather than um, perhaps you know, serving chiefly as a mitogen in glioma, might be an activity-regulated plasticity factor. And so we tested this um, electrophysiologically and found that when we puffed glutamate onto um, a patched glioma cell in the presence of BDNF, that the amplitude of the postsynaptic current was, uh, or the, of the glutamate evoked current was much larger. And that this was abrogated when we had CRISPR deleted the TREK B receptor uh, gene and TREK2 from these patient direct glioma cells. In the healthy brain, a, a key mechanism by which synaptic strength um, changes is through um, increased AMPA receptor trafficking to the postsynaptic membrane. And so looking at that in a number of different ways, and I'm showing you here a cell surface biotinylation data, we find that BDNF does increase AMPA receptor trafficking to the um, glioma cell membrane. And so these synapses exist and, and they're plastic and, and recruit mechanisms of adaptive plasticity to reinforce these interactions. In another subpopulation of glioma cells, we saw a second type of electrophysiological event. Instead of these millisecond timescale postsynaptic currents, instead we saw much larger and longer um, currents that, were, that ex you know, exhibited a seconds long timescale. And interestingly, we found that these prolonged currents increased 
with field potential, suggesting that the more neurons that were active, the larger and longer these um, currents became. And what we determined that these represented were potassium evoked um, uh, currents. So when neuro neurons are active, there's an increase in extracellular potassium that evokes these currents. Now, when we dye, cell, dye filled the cells that exhibit these prolonged potassium evoked activity dependent currents, we noticed that the dye diffused not just to a single cell, but actually to a network of cells. And so that immediately evoked for us the beautiful work from the Winkler lab showing that glioma cells can connect to each other through long project protrusions called microtubes through gap junction um, coupled networks. And, and so we wondered whether this gap junctional coupling was actually serving to amplify some of these electrical events like these potassium evoked currents. And so we block gap junctions to test that idea using a couple of different methods. And I'm showing you here um, results from a, a migraine medicine called meclofenamate. We find that with gap junctional blockade that the amplitude of these potassium evoked currents was much smaller, um, suggesting that these gap, this gap junctional coupling is serving not just to physically and uh, metabolically connect these tumor cells, but also to electrically couple them. So if the glioma cell is exhibiting multiple modes of membrane depolarization, synaptic currents, potassium evoked currents, probably other mechanisms we haven't yet discovered, that suggests that this, this process of membrane depolarization may itself be advantageous to glioma growth. And that would make a lot of sense because we know that membrane depolarization regulates healthy neural stem and precursor cell proliferation and differentiation during brain development through voltage dependent mechanisms that remain to be fully understood. And so we wondered whether the membrane depolarization itself was driving the tumor progression. And we tested this again using optogenetics, but this time expressing the light sensitive um, opsin not in the microenvironmental neurons, but rather in the tumor cells themselves, and then optogenetically depolarizing the tumor xenograft. And what we found is that indeed membrane depolarization alone increases glioma cell proliferation. While conversely, blocking glutamatergic neurotransmission, either pharmacologically using parampanel or here genetically by expressing a dominant negative version of the um, GLUA2 amper subunit, starkly decreases in vivo glioma growth and progression. And so we and, and um, you know, the Winkler group and, and others are finding that gliomas integrate into neural circuits. They're doing this through bona fide neuron to glioma synapses, as well as electrically through potassium evoked currents that are then amplified in a gap junction coupled network. We can visualize um, this electrical integration using genetically encoded calcium indicators in the malignant cells. We find that when we stimulate the afferents into the tumor that this evokes um, calcium transients, if we block action potentials using tetrodotoxin, this very starkly inhibits um, the, the calcium transients we observe. And certainly there is spontaneous neuronal activity within these um, you know, xenografted models and within patient tumors. And I think this particular calcium imaging movie really underscores this realization that these cancers are an electrically active tissue and that we must as a field begin to understand the mechanisms of malignant circuit development of assembly of plasticity and evolution over the disease course. To better understand the voltage sensitive mechanisms of proliferation and that in doing so we're likely to glean insights to normal neural development and plasticity through this magnified lens of glial cancers. The interactions between neurons and glioma cells are, are very clearly not a one-way street. These are bi-directional interactions. So just as neuronal activity is driving glioma progression, both through paracrine factors um, secretion, as well as electrically through neuron to glioma synapses, so too do the glioma cells increase neuronal excitability and activity. And this creates a vicious cycle um, by which neuronal activity is driving glioma growth and gliomas are remodeling neural circuits. We wanted to understand how early in the disease course this may be happening um, and, and to, to see this in our patients, 
Um, and so we collaborated with this really brilliant um, neurosur neurosurgeon and cancer neuroscientist, um, Sean Herbie Jumper at UCSF, who performed intraoperative electrocorticography, placing essentially a recording grid, uh, a recording um, a field recording grid over tumor infiltrated cortex and more normal appearing brain around the tumor. And what he demonstrated was that in the tumor infiltrated brain, there's marked neuronal hyperexcitability as measured by the high gamma band power. I think the mechanistic parallels that are evident between normal neuron glial and malignant neuron glioma interactions underscores very clearly that these cancers are hijacking mechanisms of normal neural development and plasticity and demand that we approach these tumors from a neuroscience perspective. As we do so, there are a number of potential therapeutic targets that emerge um, in paracrine and electrochemical interactions between neurons and glioma cells. And, and although I believe we're just at the tip of the iceberg, these include um, you know, targeting neuroligin-3 shedding, targeting neuroligin-3 binding, targeting these AMPA receptors, BDNF receptors, potassium channels, and gap junctions. And, and now coming to the title of my talk and considering you know, what is emerging as a roadmap for um, this new field of cancer neuroscience, we must understand the interactions of the nervous system with cancer, not just in central nervous system tumors, but more broadly in cancer as a whole. And this includes really four main components um, of study. Number one, electrochemical interactions between neurons and cancer cells. Um, you know, I've just begun to describe what um, we and others have found in glioma and primary brain cancers. Um, uh, Doug Hanahan and I think many others have been studying um, the way that, uh, that cancer metastases to the brain interact with the nervous system. And in the case of breast cancer brain metastases, there is a perisynaptic process that forms such that um, synaptic communication between neurons can stimulate um, uh, electrical currents uh, through the NMDA receptor in the tumor cell as described by the Hanahan group. And I think we're just at the very beginning of understanding uh, metastatic cell interactions with neurons. Whether these electrochemical interactions happen outside of the central nervous system is a really important question that remains to be answered for peripheral cancers. But what is clear in non-central nervous system tumors is that just like in glioma, where there are paracrine, um, important paracrine bidirectional interactions in prostate, pancreas, stomach, colon, skin, and breast cancer, and likely many, many others, peripheral nerves drive cancer growth through um, secreted factors, including neurotransmitters. The cancer cells increase axonal ingrowth um, and remodel the peripheral nervous system. And this, this vicious cycle is set up that, that drives Drives tumor progression in a number of different malignancies. Interactions between cancer and the nervous system can also happen on a different scale, on a systemic scale, and they're very important interactions between the brain and the tumor, often mediated through modulation of the immune system. We also know that tumors can influence through systemic interactions, sleep, mood, and cognitive function. And finally, any consideration of interactions between cancer and the nervous system um, must include the really deleterious effects of cancer therapies on the nervous system, including both cognitive impairment and peripheral neuropathies. And this, this begs the, I think, really important question of whether you know, this toxicity to the nervous system that our cancer therapies almost universally exert to some extent has a relationship to their therapeutic efficacy. And if we understand that, we may be able to develop more specific and less toxic therapies. There are many people to thank, um, my laboratory past and present, collaborators, funding sources, and last but not least, the patients and families whose donation of tumor tissue enables the work that we do. Hopefully we have a few minutes left for questions. Thank you so much for your attention. Yes, thank you so much, Michelle, uh, for this very fantastic talk. I mean, as always, I, I would like to say, but uh, I think really providing a, a stimulatory, yes, roadmap of how you sh maybe can or should interrogate these complex interactions between the nervous system and cancer and how we can learn a lot about what drives cancer progression, what drives cancer initiation. Um, 
So I think in a very clear and, and mechanistic and structured way, I think you have shown um, by a long line of fantastic research from the CNS how that can be achieved and how completely new um, ideas for translation and for new therapies can be generated that are already in clinical trials. And I think this is important to, to also underline that although this is really highly exciting basic science, it's also already creating in the US and Europe uh, clinical trials that are probing and testing these new discoveries. So that's really, I would say, an, an, an unexpected close road to, to, to translation. Maybe I can start with the first question, then I would hand over to Varun um, for moderating the question and answers. So now kind of moving to the peripheral nervous system, moving to cancers outside the brain, which we of course now make the majority of cancers and probably the, the, the majority of cancers people are joining today are interested in. What do you think are the roadblocks? I mean, we talked about roadmaps. So what are the roadblocks? What do we need to know? Um, which technologies, methodologies do we need to develop or, or employ from, from, from all the CNS cancer um, um, research to make significant progress? You have shown that there are, is a lot of data around, published data, but still it seems a lot is still a black box, uh, much more a black box like, like in the CNS. So what, 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 what would you suggest kind of to do or what would you suggest people to do? So I think there has to be a lot more interaction between neuroscientists and cancer biologists. I think that we need to really encourage multidisciplinary, you know, approaches to understand this. And I think that collaboration is the key. I think that, you know, viewing cancer from a neuroscience perspective, viewing neuroscience from a cancer perspective is going to be really important for um, making advances in, in both central nervous system and in non-central nervous system, you know, cancer. I, I think that you know the, mo the most we can do, like this lecture series, um, but but even beyond, um, you know, workshops um, when we can, in person meetings again, perhaps with you know educational days for for the neuroscience for the cancer biologist, cancer you know biology for the neuroscientist will be really important in bringing these you know two perspectives together. And if we look at history and take a step back, it wasn't so long ago that cancer biology and immunology were really quite distinct fields, and now we understand how important it has been to bring those two fields together, um, you know, and, 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 and all of the incredible advances that have happened from immuno-oncology. I think cancer neuroscience has a similar uh, potential, and it will require that kind of multidisciplinary approach. Thank you. Great answer. So I would like to hand over to Varun. Yes, uh, terrific talk, Michel, as always, and I think it's a very good broad overview that you gave us here today, and I think we have a few questions from the audience, and I'd like to start uh, with one from Martin Schmelz, who is asking whether physiological neuronal activity as such or hypersynchronized optogenetically activated uh, neuronal activity strongly supports oligodendrocyte glioma growth in vivo. And um, I think this is a very interesting question also to understand whether this is only happening during um, pathological or pathophysiological conditions. And um, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> so I showed you data from, you know, optogenetic um, stimulation experiments, but the same kind of um, myelin plasticity in the healthy brain can be evoked by um, experience and by, um, you know, uh, task uh, related increases in in neuronal activity. So certainly this is happening, we think, in both, um, you know, experimental animals, but also there's great, um, you know, um, advanced imaging data suggests it's also happening in, in humans um, in response to, to physio physiological activity, not just induced hypersynchronous. Uh, activity. That said, um, you know, do we think that it is the activity per se as communicated perhaps through neuron to oligodendroglial, you know, precursor cell synapses or through, you know, other mechanisms that that's driving, you know, the plasticity? And I think it's likely to be um, both, you know, direct electrical, you know, communication between neurons and oligodendroglial cells, as well as, you know, through critically important paracrine factors. The synaptic connectivity between neurons and oligodendrocyte precursor cells is, is really fascinating in that the OPCs 
through monosynaptic viral tracing, um, you know, have been shown to really be listening, if you will, to the entire circuit, to an entire functional circuit, but how the cells are integrating that activity, that information to make very small changes that in the healthy state fine tune circuit function is really not yet clear. Um, it's a really important set of questions. And we do have evidence that in disease states that myelin plasticity can become maladaptive and promote, um, you know, really, really deleterious changes to circuit function. So, so much more, so much more to learn. I hope that, I hope that answered the question. Great. Thank you. Um, Another question um, from uh, Linda Dove is whether, um, what are your thoughts on IDH mutant non-codeleted glioma and whether they also <clears throat> depend on these synapses or whether this is something happening specifically in um, wild type gliomas? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we haven't looked um, electrophysiologically at models of IDH mutant non-codeleted um, tumors, but we have looked at single cell transcriptomic data of these tumors. And we see very clear upregulation of synapse associated genes, just as we do in the um, IDH uh, wild type uh, tumors. So I think it is it is likely, um, and and as I recall, um, Varun, you did do electro, uh, electron microscopy in IDH mutant tumors and saw synaptic structures. Is that correct? Yes, yes, we saw we saw um, single uh, on, on the electron microscopy level. We saw it in astrocytomas, IDH mutant astrocytomas, but not in oligodendrogliomas. So this is something we believe um, also contributes to the malignancy of these astrocytomas um, in contrast to the oligodendroglomas. And I think this is something where we need to really focus also on almost all tumor entities and brain tumor tendencies to understand which one of them, which one of them will have interactions with neurons and which ones will not show any relevant interactions. I think this is an important topic for future discoveries. Another question, I think this is also again, combining two aspects of new cancer neurosciences by uh, Kai Tzu, who asks whether um, you believe that any inhibitor that targets glioma cells can damage normal brain tissue and whether it is too challenging to find specific inhibitors that only targets glioma cells. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, so this is the challenge is that the tumors appear so far to be using mechanisms that are at play in normal brain, but there may be tumor selective differences that give us a little bit of purchase to make a, a tumor selective, you know, therapeutic approach. And so, for example, um, you know, the AMPA receptors in the glioma cells are calcium permeable, while AMPA receptors in normal cells are, at least in, in mature neurons, are, are not calcium permeable. It's, it's, a, it's an earlier developmental state of an AMPA receptor. Um, and so if there were, although there is not presently, a, a calcium permeable AMPA receptor specific inhibitor, that would really selectively target the tumor and not the normal brain. That said, you know, many of the mechanisms at play in glioma um, that we have, we and, and uh, Varun and others have identified so far are targetable by drugs that are pretty well tolerated in the normal brain um, and that were actually developed for neurology and psychiatry indications. Um, so, you know, certain anti-epileptic drugs like parampanil, other kinds of medicines designed to get into the brain and target these neurotransmitter receptors and ion channels, um, you know, are generally well tolerated. And so although these processes are robust in normal tissue, that doesn't mean that we can't modulate them in a way that may decrease glioma growth. I think follow-up question for me also is, you, um, to my knowledge, you described neurologin 3 so far in the malignant context. And I was wondering about the physiological role of this, um, uh, of this molecule. And yes. I have a whole unpublished story about this. And so, you know, I, maybe you'll invite me back and I can give you the whole talk. But okay. we have identified the binding partner and it is expressed in healthy um, oligodendrocyte precursor cells. And we believe that while neuroligin 3 binding in the glioma cell very clearly drives proliferation and progression in the healthy oligodendrocyte precursor cell, rather than promoting proliferation, it, it promotes stemness of the cell and prevents different, inappropriate differentiation. 
Um, so there's there's some really interesting um, roles we think for this uh, neuroligin three shedding and binding in in healthy um, in healthy myelin biology. So uh, emerging emerging story. I'd love to tell you guys all about it when I have you know, another hour session. <laughs> Great. I think we have so many questions. I think we need to invite you back, actually. So I think, <laughs> and I think we need to um, um, have, I think, maybe one last question also by Heiko Liu. And I think he's asking whether these neuron glioma connections are transient or rather stable, mm. considering that glioma cells are proliferating and neurons are dying at the same time in the patient. Ah. So uh, whether these are stable or transient is an incredibly important question, and I'm going to refer you to um, next week's talk, perhaps, for, <laughs> for that answer. Um, but I think that, you know, whether they're, the, the idea that neurons are dying, I think, is, is something I'd like to comment on. Um, you know, glioblastoma and other um, tumors that have a nodular core um, also have this diffusely infiltrative you know, component of the tumor, often referred to as the margin, that nodular core has very different biology than the invasive component. And actually the nodule isn't our biggest problems. You know, neurosurgeons can resect the nodule. A lot of the, you know, molecular studies we've done on these tumors are from that resected nodular tissue, but that's not what usually kills our patients. What kills our patients is the diffusely infiltrative component. Now in pediatric gliomas, there's no nodule usually. It's, it's just an intrinsically infiltrative disease. And that infiltrative component, um, that invasive intrinsic component of gliomas that are so lethal, that's what's integrating. That's where we see upregulation of synaptic gene expression. And, and that's what colonizes the brain and ultimately results in the circuit dysfunction that kills our patients. So there isn't so much death of neurons outside of that nodule. There is remodeling of the circuitry and dysfunction of neurons. But, but the tumor cells need neuronal activity to progress, we believe. And consistent with that, we really don't see a lot of neuronal death. Maybe I'll end on that. <laughs> That's very terrific. And I think we now have reached our time limit for this, this week's seminar. And I think all the questions already show how exciting your talk was and how exciting the field is, how, uh, we, how much we still need to learn. And I think um, you have shown us a very, very interesting way and very important ways of studying this disease. And I think uh, I'm very happy that you were able to talk here today. And um, with this, uh, maybe I give to Frank back and uh, for his concluding remarks. Thank you for... Well, yeah, I think I think you did the conclusion in an um, uh, excellent way. So I, I, I can just add that, um, yeah, this was a um, great talk, great discussion. Not the last time that you are with us, hopefully, so there will be more to come in the future. And um, I think it's it's really important that the the, that the the field, which is yeah not large, yeah, we are not at immuno oncology yet in terms of numbers of, um, but it's rapidly growing and it's proliferating, and um, and that's great. And I think. Uh, Collaboration is key, as Michelle said, and it's um, it's good to collaborate at the same spot with uh, with all kind of people involved. It's great to collaborate across the oceans and across the Atlantic Ocean and this, uh, or Pacific, whatever. And it's um, and that is that is uh, important to really stimulate and 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 uh, get uh, get get uh, yeah. Um, uh, make steps forward here in this important field of, um, and it's cross-stimulatory for neuroscience for cancer. So I saw more than 140 participants today. That's, I think, all-time record here in our seminars. And this is now the threshold that we need to reach in the future for, for future seminars. So um, that uh, only shows um, how much interest is there. And uh, it, of course, shows uh, um, the, the, the quality and excitement about your work, Michelle. So Thanks again. Thank you so much for uh, being with us today, for stimulating us, for, um, for, for guiding the field. And um, yeah, uh, I hope you have a, have a great, I think it's, it's quite more, um, more early morning now in, 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 right. in, in <laughs> California. So <laughs> have, have a great and productive day today. Thank you so much. Wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for your great questions and for your attention. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Bye.